Hey friends, uh, my name is Nelson Furtado. I'm one of the pastors at West Point First United Methodist Church. And um, in light of everything that is going on in the country, um, I decided or we decided, Cal and I, to uh, have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about, about, about racism, racial relations, protests, and, and, and yeah, everything that is going on in the country today. So uh, we're just two pastors that know each other that have a heart for 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 the lord for the church and and are willing to have a hard conversation so uh here we go cal um i'm cal busman i am the lead pastor at uh, new community church in lagrange georgia i've only been the lead for about a year and a half i came in as the associate pastor um under the leadership of um a black pastor uh, we are a, an intentionally racially diverse church. This church was established 27, 28 years ago to be a racially diverse church. Um, and so I was telling Nelson um, when we were talking a couple days ago that this was handed to me. I inherited this really beautiful, diverse tapestry um, of a church that's, that's, um, that's biracial. We have Hispanics. And so... I am getting to benefit from people who have worked before. Um, we met. I met Nelson through um, a shared friend. Mm -hmm. Had him preach here last July, and and now I know I can have him back. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm excited to have this conversation too. I can consider, consider, even though Nelson and I have only talked a couple of times, I consider him a really good friend, and I think we're wired the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, this conversation I think is going to be a good one. Yeah, and let me go ahead and say thank you very much for your willingness to have this conversation. I know that this is a time where a lot of people are, they worry about self-preservation and don't want to start this conversation, don't yeah. want to get into this mess of having a, a conversation about racial tensions, racial relationships in, in this country. So so thank you very much for, for your willingness to, to, to talk about this. Likewise. So... Uh, <laughs> So what, what, one of the things that in, in a conversation they mentioned that we were having a couple of days ago, you, uh, you referenced to this that I, I think I knew, but I had never heard in that framework, which is the difference between race, uh, racism, um, uh, oh my God, what was it? Racism. Prejudice and discrimination. Prejudice. Yes. Can you break this down for, for us again, please? Um, I'll be glad to. I'm not going to take credit for this, but I can't remember what the what my source was from this. So I'm I'm going to defer that someone else said this, and I just happened to to kind of pull it together. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that that you and I were at um, several days ago, um, I heard a lot of conversation about personal responsibility, which mm -hmm. I think is really important. Um, we we are responsible for our own beliefs, the way that we view people who aren't like us. Um, and, and the church has always been about that, but we've kind of backed off conversations about systems and structures in society that really shape and mold how we make those personal decisions. So mm -hmm. when this person explained how prejudice and racism bubbles up and, and is concretized, uh, they said that, that prejudice and discrimination are those personal beliefs that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and I was saying to a friend on the phone earlier today, we're all racist. We just have to figure out what kind of racist we are. Mm -hmm. That we all have prejudices. We all discriminate based on experience, um, what our family of origin believed, mm -hmm. um, our view of scripture. All of those things form our personal beliefs and our prejudices and our discrimination comes out of that. A humorous note, this is how I view mine. When I'm driving and somebody cuts me off and when I see who they are, it doesn't matter if they're old, young, black, white, male, female, I always go, oh, it figures. <laughs> so I equally practice beliefs about certain people groups. Mm -hmm. The way I understand racism is, it is when those personal beliefs, prejudices, the way we discriminate are written into law, and then woven into society and culture as far as mores and norms, that's, that's how, what I believe is racism. Mm -hmm. And so okay. we can address our own personal beliefs, the way we discriminate, the way that we hold our prejudices, but that's not going to dismantle 
inequitable treatment in, in our country. We have to address systemic racism and structures that are woven into laws mm -hmm. and the way we practice our society. So it was explained to me that way, and, and I know that's a long explanation, but that's how I understand the difference between those. Yeah, so, so racism would be, so we all make judgments or we have frequency ideas about about different people the issue with racism then will be the negative effect that it has in the way that we have relationship with others would you say that right and i know that, that some of these might be a little controversial but redlining is a classic racist um effort to control where different people live uh, the fact that schools are funded by property taxes mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is a way that racism is systemically woven into culture. That means areas that are more affluent have nicer schools than areas mm -hmm. that are less affluent. It, it's that's racism, and that's how uh, it, that's a great explanation that someone else made that I think paints a bigger picture than just our personal beliefs. Yeah, and and, and I think understanding those things. Well, first understanding that that we we all have and make pre-judgments or have ideas of other people. I think it's right. helpful for us to, to start having honest conversations. My sister, today or yesterday, she posted this, um, what I'm calling a, 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 a racist spectrum from going to terrorists, to uh, allies, to white savior, to abolitionists, and, and telling how the different views that people have or the different responses that they have to other races um, 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 kind of influence and impact our society. So I think understanding first that we all make judgments, but also understand the impact of that this judgments have with other people is essential for us to understand uh, what is going on in the country today. Because I think that is what what brought to to I think to light all those protests and rioting and and, and even root, uh, looting for that matter that how people on the other end of the judgments that we make are feeling. So, right. um, and, and, and every time that I'm in this conversation, sometimes I have to explain uh, my position and all those things because everybody lumps together protesting, rioting, and looting. So uh, at first for me, uh, what, what I try to make sure that people understand is that the protesting and the rioting are reactions or are responses and are not the first action. So people are protesting, they're not, most people are not at, at home trying to figure out what is the best way to burn the whole country or throw all the system upside down. People right. want to live a good life. People want to care for their children and go to work. But because of the judgment that they are experiencing, because of the kind of life that they are experiencing in this country, they feel the need to voice out what is going on. And it comes to a place that, that, uh, Pacific protests or 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 uh, just speaking up doesn't do doesn't bring the attention that needs. So people feel they need to go out and to uh, again like like we saw two weeks ago burning a, a, a police station or a police precinct. So people would then hear uh, what they're saying. And it's not that I'm condoning or supporting burning stores or burning police precincts. But I understand why people are so angry. People are so frustrated. People are so, uh, I don't know, so, so feeling such a pain that the only way that they feel that they can voice out and be heard is by doing those extreme ads. So uh, I, I'm feeling the need sometimes to call people to have simple, simple empathy. Yes. For the pain and the anger and the anguish that so many are feeling, and and uh, I was having a conversation with with another friend a couple of weeks ago, and telling him like, when you go to a funeral, when you know that someone is in pain and hurting, you don't try to argue what the deceased could have done to get to a different outcome. Right. You show you show your love and your sympathy. So I think what what the start of the conversation is: Black people in this country are hurting. Black people in this country are mourning. And I think if we had started the conversation with what well, we say after a tragedy happens, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I think people had said my thoughts and prayers are with black people while they are voicing out their pain, their frustration, their, their, their anger, their suffering. I think we would have been in a different place. 
I agree. We don't do lament well, do we? No. Job's friends were really good when they just sat alongside of him and were quiet. But the minute they tried to explain to him, God goes like, nope, that's not how it's done. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I, I don't think we're ever talking about this, but Job is one of my favorite uh, uh, books in the Bible. Favorite lesson because of that, because it right. changed completely the, the 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 way that that we think usually when someone is suffering or going through something like what is the sin that you committed what did you do wrong? absolutely and job spent the whole book trying to say i don't know what happened i didn't do anything wrong right. and, and but i'm know, still feeling all of this it's, I, i'm exactly right when we see the protest and, and it may bother us and we don't know how to understand it and, and i think and this is a white person saying this what is it inside of us that's keeping us from practicing the empathy that you talked about and pulling up next to him and going like, wow, I feel a lot of emotion here. Mm -hmm. I, I may not like how I see you acting it out, but because Christ did this when he, you know, when Jesus did it, when he walked among the people, I'm going to pull alongside of you and I want to hear your heart. I want to hear mm -hmm. your struggles. I want to hear your frustrations before I judge. And we've all done this before where we judge somebody based on behavior that we saw, and then we heard their story. Oh, they lost a spouse, they lost a child. And then we reframe how we experience their lament or their protest. Yeah, and it's not that you try to justify oh, no. the, the, the action. And, and this is and, and this is how, what I've spent so much time in this past couple of weeks doing. I'm not trying to justify what people are doing. What I'm saying is that I understand. I understand what you're doing. Right. I understand why this is the only way that you feel heard. And and quite honestly, that's that's what's happening. Before a lot of people are not turning their eyes or their ears to the to the oppression, to the hurting, to the suffering the black people are experiencing. But now, because of all that has happened, people are saying, ah, it there might be something here. There's mm -hmm. all it, it also has to do with with seeing the videos of of Ahmaud Aubrey and, and George Floyd, um, it, it, it caused a lot of people to actually see a footage of that suffering or, right. or, or of an expression of what was happening to say, well, maybe putting the video together with the reaction that people are starting to support more or at least listen more, try to understand more what Black people have been saying for for 600 years, pretty much. I was, was going to say, no matter how far you go back, it needs to be fun. I like the word that i like that you use the word understanding because somehow in our culture we've equated understanding with agreement mm -hmm. in order for me to understand you i have to agree with you and that's not true i can understand you mm -hmm. and go that's you but I, i'm going to do that and so i, I think that apparently the, the the george floyd murder was a tipping point for something that we should have been understanding way back with Philando Castile and Trayvon Martin and Walter Scott and all and all of those others, mm -hmm. but this was a tipping point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was I was laughing a, a, a minute ago because I can see my wife now watching this video and laughing because that's the same thing that I said and I had always had uh, problems in conversations that I had that I had to explain to people. I understand what you are saying. I just disagree. Right. So I think there's a there's a there's a distinction here that needs to be said. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I understand your suffering. I, I can have empathy. I cannot, I'm not necessarily agree with the way that you're expressing it. I'm not necessarily agreeing with the way that you are, that the way that this, your opinion is being manifested by understand. And I think, um, and again, I don't speak for all black people in America or in the world, but for me as a, as a black man living in America, this is what I was looking for in this past three, four weeks maybe, or even before, and very few people were able to express this. I was I was looking for people to say, I understand, or right. I, I, I know, I recognize and acknowledge that there's something wrong here happening. Might not necessarily agree with, with the way that you're phrasing, with the way that we're responding to it, but I acknowledge that there's something wrong. Right, and we can do that with people. It's funny, you mentioned your wife. My wife and I did the same thing. We were walking a couple of days ago and there was an issue that we, disagreed on mm -hmm. but because we made a commitment there's we have a covenant between us mm -hmm. of caring for the person more than protecting our beliefs that we were willing to go like i i don't agree with you but i understand and and, mm -hmm. and what i hear you saying is that's 
that's that I know you're not speaking for this monolithic black community, but that's what that's what the black community seems to be saying, both individuals and in a united way. Just just understand what it's like to to experience what we experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. Another thing that you that you said before in your comment was about about the different layers of Think of responsibility there's there's and, and and this is one of the things i think a lot of people they are educating themselves now and, and looking for ways to respond or to to, to become an allies or to change the the course that we are going as a country they're looking for for the personal responsibility the communal responsibility and and there's also this word or this expression that's been throwing around a lot not throwing around but but being mentioned a lot now which is systemic responsibility or systemic racism right um so how do you see before we talk about the personal and the communal responsibilities how do you see systemic racism what is systemic racism for you um i met with a a, a young person yesterday for counseling on a different situation mm -hmm. but they're a person of color who was going through a particularly rough time and they just needed to go somewhere and, and to think about it. And they talked about how they were sitting in their car parked in this public space and they saw a law enforcement drive by and see them. Mm -hmm. And I, I have never had that experience of feeling a sense of threat being in this person's position. Mm -hmm. And I watched them talk about what that felt like to be a person of color sitting in a car by yourself mm -hmm. in a public place and being seen by law enforcement. Now, the, the law enforcement showed up. They were absolutely wonderful. So this is not a condemnation about a, a sweeping broad hand about law enforcement. There are issues. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it was understanding what systemic racism does. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on every level. I, if, if I were sitting in a public place in my car and saw a police officer drive by, I wouldn't have the same reaction they did. Mm. So I know that doesn't describe all of systemic yeah. racism, and it's probably more the effect of it. Yeah. But yeah I, but I, I, I finally started to feel what, just a little bit of what mm. that person felt. Yeah, and, and, and for me, yeah, I think, I think this is a, is a perfect example of of what of the effect of, of of systemic racism that that you experience that there is in an institution an organization that has systems in place that work against you yeah. so it's not as you say it's not condemning all all police officers no. or, or all the 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 um all police in itself but it's understanding that there is a system that works differently for white people and for black exactly. people because the concern is not that this might be a racist well there is that concern that this yeah. may be a racist police officer or or, or this is it's it's a great person that it just got out his bed in the morning kissed his wife and his children and went out to do great work mm -hmm. but it's also a concern that whatever is going on here I'll know that I'll be treated differently because of the color right. of my skin. Right. So it's how the entire system is designed. If maybe, I don't know, if I have a, a, a parking, I don't know, a parking ticket or a speeding ticket, if I were white, the system will treat me in one way. But since I'm black, the system will treat me a different way. And there's tons of data, tons of research showing that the same crime or the same, uh, uh, the same, the same infraction but different penalty and the only the single different thing was the color of the skin of the person right so well, the classic I, example is the is the the sentences and the punishment for cocaine possession and crack possession mm -hmm. it's the same thing and and it's funny i may be dodging your question a little bit um because i i don't experience systemic mm -hmm. racism i've read about it I've, uh -huh. I've listened to friends of mine who have talked about how they've experienced it and I, I know about redlining, I know about hotels, I know about bank loans, I, you know, I, I know about profiling, but I've never experienced it. So it, it's hard for me. I don't know if, 
if you want to talk about it or if you've experienced yeah, and, it? And so with with policing, which is the, with just the topic that we're having now, I, I tell people that most of my encounters with police officers have been great and been positive. They have been uh, polite, educated. I've, uh, but but there are some that I had this like this was one time that I was driving on 85. I was going to Atlanta, and I was stopped by the police officer, and he gave me like three different reasons for this stop, and then just yeah. end up letting me go with uh, with a warning or advice or whatever. But and that time I was like, is is this because he's a bad police officer and he doesn't know what he's doing? Is this because I'm black and he's trying to pin something on me, or what? What is going on here? What is the situation? And I think as 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 you ex, as you the examples that you gave are are great for me to understand systemic racism. You talk about uh, redlining and the effect that it has in in education, um, bank loans. I think Wells Fargo's one that a few years ago had a major lawsuit, and they have to give a lot of explanation, which I think they haven't yet got to the. I, I haven't done that yet, so can I see if they got to the bottom of this or not? But they were being sued because it was obvious that they were charging higher interest for uh, for black people than for white people, which brings again this great disparity in in in, in economic. Um, so the levels of, of education, access to education. Um, I mean, so there, there's so, so many things, so many systems that are designed for people not to advance in life. I think that's, right. that's, that's, I think that's the, the, the ultimate design to maintain black people in the lesser than situation, in the lesser than uh, of, of status. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I also don't know if I answer your question, but that's, that's. No. It, it's, it, sometimes it feels like, again, everything I say is an attempt for a white person to understand what it's like to be a person of color in our culture, but it feels like it's this nebulous, always shifting mm -hmm. thing that you go like, that, that looks like it, and, 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 this, and the people in control go like, no, it's not. We're being fair. We're being, mm -hmm. and, and so you can give specific examples, but then it's always thrown like, well, you know, blacks just don't work as hard, or they're just not as, and so you get all of this that kind of tries to smoke screen it, or spray mm -hmm. paint it, or something like that, and it's, I, I can't imagine how frustrating it would be for me to see something, to know that that's really the way it is, uh -huh. and and the, the, the systems and structures are constantly moving and dancing and shifting to kind of cover the fact that, that that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and, and I think, and again, going back to what we're experiencing in the, in, in, in the country in this, in, in this season, is exactly that, that people have spoke about it, people have talked about it, wrote books about it, uh, wrote posts on Facebook about it, now at football games, and, and, and then people still try to over and over and over right. again come up with excuse to say, oh no, there's nothing wrong here, that black people are just, are just lazy or, or, or any of the other stereotypes. Right. Uh, and that they're Rather not the, just doing the, 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 the right amount of effort that I did or that my parents or grandparents and, or ancestors did to get to the same place where we are now. Oh, I know. Um, rather than, than going like, okay, all, some of what I believe might be true, mm -hmm. some of it might not be true, people don't want to start with themselves and go like, okay, are there some things in me that I can't see? And, and, and as as ministers, we always believe that. We always believe there's like little closets and little dark rooms in the, in the house of our soul that we've locked off and we go, okay, God, I don't want you to look at that or I don't, I don't want to examine that part. There doesn't seem to be that sense of, I'm willing to sit down and lay it all out and kind of do an autopsy on myself and go like, ooh, there's that thing inside of me. And then yeah. knowing that that will change how I view the systems and structures in the world. That's right. It, it, that simple is it's 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 so good because yet yeah, we seem to be honest about the the gray areas or the things that we don't want to touch in every other aspect of our lives. Oh, absolutely. But when it comes to race, and and I was I was talking to someone about this. That I think that's the reason that we still say that racism is an issue or that we have a racist. No, that's why racism is such a complicated topic 
to talk about. It's it's only complicated because we don't want to admit that we have racist intentions or racist thoughts or there there's a level that we are racist ourselves. So that's why we want to push forward because we don't want to get to the place that we want to admit. Well, maybe as you were saying in the beginning, I have some racist thoughts or tendencies that I don't want to deal with. And and I don't know, maybe part of that is because they benefit me, maybe because this is is, is a scapegoat that I have. And if I admit that, then I have to admit that I have a personal responsibility. I, I don't know. I'm not sure why, but I but I understand that there's that that we don't want to talk about this. We're talking about marriage or finances, but when it comes to race, we don't want to admit that there's something wrong. Yeah. Um. This probably isn't on our agenda, but I want to go there. <laughs> how, how do how do we help? Because I think it's an important question. Then how do we help people? And I, I don't care about saving face. I don't care about making it easier for people. How do we help guide people to a place where they're willing or really desiring to do that? Hmm. To, to, to dig down and go like, I know it's in there. I, I need to find it. How do we? And here's the classic example. It's that Tupperware of that old thing in the back of your fridge. There's a smell coming from your fridge. And, yeah. and, and you're not going to give up until you find out what that thing is in the back of your fridge. Why don't we have that? We know that it smells and there's mm -hmm. something rotten. Why don't we have that same intensity? Yeah, and, and I think part of that is, is I think who's pushing that envelope? I think there's someone that needs to start the conversation because if, if, if it is true what you said in the beginning, I think it is that everybody has a racist thought or a racist tendency, let's talk about it. We don't have to come to a place where you, um, you have you're in your company and you try to hire two candidates and you're wondering if you are not hiring one because it's black or if you have to get to that point that 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 you are in the place to make a decision and you're wondering if you're making or not making that decision because you're uh, because you have racist thoughts or tendencies. I think we need to start that conversation uh, right now or so you. You don't wait for you to get sick to kind of go to the doctor. You take your vitamins and your exercise and you do all the preventive work. Mm -hmm. So when when whatever happens, you you have built that uh, uh, the structures that you need. So I think part of that is that we continue to say that this is a hard topic. We continue to say that 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 people don't want to talk about it. So I think that's why we don't start with that. It it, it as I was talking to a Sunday school class, racism is a sin, and we as pastors address uh most sins yes, on the pulpit <laughs> as, as yeah. we preach so i think i think for us and in this in the context of this conversation as religious leaders um i think we need to start that naming as a sin and addressing as a sin and and inviting people to fight uh to fight this sin whatever they're whatever way they're manifesting in their lives so i think is starting the conversation and i think not not only on the church level not not only on the sunday morning level but creating small groups or having personal conversations with people right. because one of the things that i learned as a pastor about confession of sin is that people don't like to confess their sins in public but they do in a private conversation and 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 i'm sure that that has been uh, your it's experience really that when you're in the context of a of, 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 of pastoral care session, when you have someone in the office, they are more free and more open to confess their sins and to deal with them. But in the context of the whole group, they will uh, say that they don't struggle with that. They don't deal with that. So I, I think we need to create spaces where people feel comfortable enough to say, I'm struggling with this. Yeah. How can I get help? Okay. That's really good. I'm kind of a big proponent of of safe spaces, and and it might have been Brene Brown because this is her topic. But it was safe spaces to be brave, mm -hmm. yeah. um, because no place feels absolutely safe. There are some moments, even with people who love and adore you, that there's a vulnerable moment where you have to say something that you're not sure how the other person is gonna how is gonna receive it. And I know just because the amount of counseling that I do without oversharing, sometimes it's investing first in the conversation. You know, uh -huh. here is where I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pull open the, my own vulnerability a little bit. Like, here's where I 
honestly struggle without oversharing. You mm -hmm. don't want to make the relationship uncomfortable or awkward mm -hmm. to, to, to go first. Yeah, and, and yeah, as I say, in, 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 in a Methodist tradition, um, we have uh, John Wesley started the, with the small groups and, 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 uh, and he had in, in the structure of the Methodist system that he designed, he had the bands. And the bands were this small group in this space where people would come and confess their sins to one another and be held accountable for those sins, but also they would get help in not committing those sins again. So I think in a way, as, as we're saying, and, 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 uh, um, and I think so many people have, have said this uh, uh, already about creating those safe spaces where we can confess our sins or can be held accountable for our right. sins. But you, we also have a supporting group of people that will walk with us and help us not to fall on that, on that sin again. Yeah. And then, and then putting racism in that category, like you said, um, gives us all of the tools and gifts and processes that we use for other sins for the sin of racism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're a hair over 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so how do we want to, the next last five or 10 minutes? I do want, we, we had this earlier on and I, and I hate to kind of go back to this, mm -hmm. but I think those of us who haven't experienced really overt or really any kind of racism need to hear what it feels like mm. um and and when you see the eight minutes and 46 seconds of george floyd or you mm. see the videos that we see walter scott getting run down or are those things how do you like how do you feel how does that affect you what 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 what, would, what do we need to know that you experience that we don't experience when we see those things. And that's yeah, so I'll, unfair I'll, for me I'll, to ask you that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and I wanna, yeah, see my voice already changed. Um, yeah. there's, 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 a, there's a huge level of emotion in that. George Floyd, I didn't watch the whole video. Um, yeah. I, I just couldn't. Um, it's 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 hard. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend, and I think we even talked about this. There's um, there's a level of, of there's a in the black community, and also in the Hispanic Latino community is also a community that I'm part of. Uh, we experience things a lot more as a community than as individuals. So when I watch all the videos of, of, of black people being treated unjustly. Uh, with, when I watch all the, all the videos of, of, of those confrontations and even of those killings, it feels like it's happening to someone in my family. It feels like it's happening to someone that I know, even though I have never seen that person before, it feels like that is happening to someone that, 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 I, that I know that is a family member, is a friend. So it has this, it already starts with this, level of, of of emotion because I this 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 is another black person that is experiencing that is sharing some life experiences uh with me. Um with Ahmaud Aubrey after I it took me I, I took a few days to watch just because I've heard the description of, of, of the video and, and and I told my wife not to watch it. I don't know if she did or not, but it was And after we watched, or after I watched the video, before that, my wife and I, we were, uh, my wife and, and my daughter and I, we were walking and exercising outside in our, in our community. After I watched the video, I have never, I, I, I have not walked in my community again. Uh, just because there were too many similarities with, with Ahmad and myself, a black man exercising in his community, which was a, a exclusive which was a white community with maybe a few black people living in so it was it was just too real and too close to home for me to have the stomach to go outside and walk again and that and that understanding that again i'm i'm one of the pastors of one of the largest churches in my community i'm 
extremely involved with everything that happens in my community. I've been living in the same house for close to two years. And still when I walked outside, there were people that didn't know me, that there were people that had never seen me before. And so when I was walking out, I was the black man walking in the street. I was not the husband or the father or the pastor or the friend or the, 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 the person who was engaged in improving uh, my community as a whole, not just the, the, the portion where black people live, but the whole community. I was just a black man and that's how I was seen until I identified myself as the pastor of First Methodist, as Michelle's husband, as Sophia's father. And then it, 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 it is hard to not feel safe in your own community, in your own neighborhood, where you are spending so much time and energy uh, trying to improve and make a better place. So, I mean, personally, I, 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 I don't think I have had a full night of sleep, a good night of sleep since uh, what happened with Ahmad. Um, eating patterns have changed. Uh, levels of energy, emotion have been everywhere. There's sometimes that I feel sad and I feel like crying. Um, And, 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 and it's hard because I feel that I, I have to, I still feel that I have to, to, to be articulate and, and, and process all my, all this, this emotion. I can, as a black man, I don't feel that I am allowed to not make sense of not being coherent. Even in this conversation that I have with, 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 with a good friend, I, I, I feel that I have to process all my emotion and sound coherent because there are going to be people that are going to question everything that I'm saying and dismiss my pain, my hurt, my, my anger. So, so I'm, I'm tired. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm tired of, 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 of yeah, um, having to sound and having to be articulate every time, having to gather my thoughts, having to suppress my, my emotions so that doesn't affect uh, the way that I express myself. Putting that together with English being my second language, so, so there's not even discount for that. I always have to be on point and on mark. So it's, it's exhausting and... and, and yeah. Oh, I am sorry. And I, I, I'm not going to, I mean, we're too good of friends for me to do the, I hear you, I understand. I, I, I don't, I'm, um, you mentioned that you see those people as family, that those people who have been, not those people, but the people who have been killed in, in the videos as family. And I think that's where we need to own our guilt and responsibility that we don't have that same. Mm -hmm. um, connection. I know. I know when my wife and I watch the the George Floyd video, the George Floyd video. Um, it's it's not just a, a random black person that I don't know, and and I'm not even close to having that same sense of connection. That you do but once i can kind of do that um janet and i were watching 60 minutes this past sunday night and they had uh this woman who who prosecuted um these kind of race cases and i recognize her last name and she is the cousin of gwen eiffel who was the pbs news anchor who just was so good for years and died of breast cancer just probably a couple of years ago it was her cousin and i saw the restraint in her voice and I saw her dialing back her emotions and her passion. And I said to Janet, I said, well, she, she, she's not wanting to do that. She's having to do that so it won't distract from what she feels like she needs to say. And I said, that is so unfair mm -hmm. that she mm -hmm. had to do it. And that's what I hear you saying is there's an extra expectation on you that in this shared suffering and in this watching someone go through a difficult thing you can't be fully you because you know that will distract that will hurt the cause that you're trying to forward mm -hmm. yeah. which is even more oppression to, to yeah. stifling who you are we have we have someone on staff uh, a black female who is all the time wrestling with the unfortunate um 
very prejudicial image of the angry black woman. Mm. And she knows that she constantly has to watch how she says things. And she's wickedly smart um, and very passionate. Mm. And she knows um, it's something she has to be overly cautious about. So, so since you brought up the, the, the church, I would love to hear <clears throat> some comments about you and, and, and how how new community is, is going at, and, and, and this for, for a lot of people seems such a foreign idea or concept of, of a church where black, white, Hispanic, Asian people can come together and worship. So can you tell us a little about, about new community and how you guys are, are, are navigating also through, through, through this time and through this season? Um. One thing I can say about New Community Church is I have zero to do for the, the culture and the nature of this church. It's been, a, here's this really great, cool thing. Walk with us on, on this journey. Um, some specific things that I know this church has done to be who they are um, is, is hiring. It's visibility on the platform. Our tech and worship team are fantastic in making sure that on the platform every Sunday, you see the richness of the diversity of the community and of the body of this church on, on the platform. And that's not just t token or, you know, handed position, it's real positions. Mm -hmm. um, my people don't know it yet, but I'm not preaching this Sunday. <laughs> and one of our school teachers who lives in my neighborhood, um, an African American woman is preaching this Sunday. Mm -hmm. And she's not teaching, she's not sharing, She's not giving, she's preaching. <clears throat> and so our church highlights not only male and female, but also um, diversity roles. So it's in hiring, it's in placement, it's in our lobby. Um, so there's an intentionality in the visibility and leadership mm -hmm. that it, we're, we're seeing the same. The fact that I came into a church with a lead pastor who was black was really appealing to me. I loved that. Uh, now he had to answer a call from God and go to another church. <laughs> but I think I think that's one of the big things is there's just an intentionality to kind of push against what would be a natural drift mm -hmm. and say, we value this and we're going to do the things to make it to make it happen. Our elder board um, is racially diverse and gender diverse, um, uh, men and women, um, and then a different uh, color people on there. So um, in all, all the different aspects, we are very intentional about how new community acts as a church. And, and, and we, we, I think we danced, before recording this, we danced around this, um, that we also wanted to include as part of this conversation, kind of a way that the church can be better and do better. And, and I think that not necessarily just the church, I think, this could apply also for 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 companies and and and, and for different organizations but uh I, I don't know how long we've been talking we we all said that we could go for three hours on this we're, we're at 45 minutes in case you're wondering oh thank you so for this next i don't know three to five minutes however long we think people can can handle more conversation on this oh they're still with us they know we're fascinatingly interesting <laughs> <laughs> so what what are some of the things that that churches, companies, social clubs can do to lead us forward to, 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 to do a better job. And, and because you pointed this out, I don't want it to seem that you're prescribing new community for every organization. But let me say this, I think a lot of what new community is doing is what I think personally, churches and, and different communities, different institutions, should do when you said about intentionality uh being intentional about having people in the platform being intentional about having the whatever diversity the church has or the organization has displayed a uh, huge thing for me when i'm looking to another community another church another organization is is to look and see some if someone like me is already there if yeah. I'm going to be the first black person there, if my family is going to be the first black family there, uh, it, it shows me how long I hate this term, but it's, it's, it is what it is. If I'm going to be the token black man in the organization, so 
So this helps me to know what kind of place and the kind of environment I'm getting myself into. Um, um, so yeah, another thing for me is sharing power. And because we've been in this conversation for four or five minutes, I'm not going to talk and say the whole spiel, but uh, this is what I see in the, in the New Testament community. Uh, when the, the Jewish and the Greek communities were together, when Jews and Gentiles were together and issues would arise in the community, we, we often see the Jewish community or the Jewish disciples empowering the, the Greek or the Gentile disciples. So sharing power, sharing resources, empowering uh, uh, the minority community in whatever context they are. So if, if we're in a predominantly Black uh, community, what can we do to empower, to elevate uh, uh, white and Asian and Latino? Um, um, just for references, I, I, I don't think I said that, but I'm a pastor of a predominantly white church. So this is a conversation that we have in, in this sense that I'm the, 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 the minority in this sense, but it also applies to a, a predominantly African-American, predominantly Black church, uh, empowering, giving resources, giving voice to whatever the minority community in the context is. Yeah. Um, it, it, a couple of things real quick. Um, I felt really guilty about doing this. I, I preached on Mother's Day, which just feels weird for me to talk about the importance of women as a, <laughs> as a guy. But, and I wrestled with, I, I talked with some of the women on staff and, and some of the women that I, I think are just really strong, forceful leaders. And they said that sometimes it, it, women need to, men need to hear and women need to hear, this is what we need to do. And so my, my whole push on Mother's Day was sometimes men need to get off the platform, set the microphone down. This is not to give permission. This is not to allow. This is what you said, to share power. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a female preacher a couple Sundays before Mother's Day, and we're having another one, a different one, this Sunday. So it's not, it's not tokenism. It's not shared platform. Mm -hmm. It's hopefully an understanding of, of shared power, just mm -hmm. like you said. The, the intentionality about growing this kind of church, I have been involved in the cross-cultural sharing platforms and churches getting together for a long time. Two churches ago, uh, we, I was in a mostly white church. We formed a relationship with an African-American church. We shared we didn't share pulpits. We would mm -hmm. travel in mass to each other's church. We would picnic together. We would go over each other's houses. We felt like it was a really healthy m movement to, to, to blend people together and cross what are natural divides. I've been in this church for almost three years now. And all of that I did two churches ago isn't even close to being like doing daily community mm -hmm. together. Um, there's a group of us that, that hang out together after church when we could. We call it after party, and we talk about the sermon. We started it when, when Lamar was still here, and then it, and it's a racially diverse group, and then we would go have lunch together. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a Black-owned business that we love to, because the food was great, <laughs> but we love the people that owned it. And we would go in there, and he would be shocked. He's from out of state. He goes like, I don't see this a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think anything about it because we just really like each other and mm -hmm. we like hanging out together. And so I realized that the intentionality has to be more than just switching pulpits or, or things like that. There has to be just a daily doing life together. Um, we, we have a racially, this is, this is really, I'm taking a chance telling you this. We have a racially diverse group that I put together that's called the... <clears throat> This is us live conversation group. <laughs> okay. And it's a messenger group with about five or six of us in it that are racially diverse, which I didn't even think about until just now. But we live chat about this is us while we're watching it. But that's my <laughs> wife crazy because she's focused on it. Bro, can you believe Randall did that? Well, what's up with you know, what's up with Kate? And and so that's mm. how deep our daily life goes. That man, like, come on, September, we gotta get our group talking talking again yeah but and, and and the point that you're bringing i think is so important for that it starts with developing relationships i think this is um uh, this is one of the things that that i hear a lot but very few people talk value the the, the small beginning so yeah. for pastors yes find find a a, a a black church if you're in the white church find a black right. church if you're in a black church find a white church say hey uh 
we need more diversity. We need more diverse relationships because I think that exposes you to people that are different from you and that helps change the image that you have. So if you only have the image that white people are this, white people are that, or black people are this, black people are that, when you come into relationships, then you start changing some of the image. And it start, as you said, in the other church, go to picnic together, worship together, see the things that you like and, and the things that you have in common, see the things that you have that are completely different, see, see the things that, that get on your last nerve. And, and right. that is what it means to be, that's what we do as family. That's, that's, that's yeah. that what it means to share life together. And that is, I think you start moving to this place where you have the this is us group which now you need to include me on that because yeah I, are you I a fan? hear about it and i'm sorry are you a fan oh yes of course of course i'll put you in there so so um i think that those relationships that it start kind of on it, it's it's almost like dating it start with one checking the other out and then we start seeing that we like it about each other and then we see the things that, that get on our last nerves but we are willing to pass and move over that because the relationship is so much important yeah and and, and, and you put the value into that by the by making it a priority which is what i what i hear you saying no so i think education is also a very important mm -hmm. um <clears throat> even though sometimes <laughs> As I said, I, I, I get a little tired of, of having to educate people about, about American history, about what is going on, I think, um, helping people to educate themselves, giving, giving out resources to people on what they need to read, different voices that they need to, to hear, kind of to move out of their own, uh, and something just fell, move out of their own echo chambers and listen to other voices. I think is uh, is very important, and I know that you share with new community some resources in this time. What what are some of the resources that you have on top of your head, and then we can also make available for people uh, later on some of, some of the resources. But what what are some of the resources that you're sharing with uh, with your people? Um, it, it I, I posted a, a reading list on my personal Facebook page about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and it was. It was Ta-Nehisi Coates. It was the um, the new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But but it also in um, in worship, I have shown Dr. William Barber videos. Mm -hmm. I have shown I showed the story of Ruby Bridges, and so I think it's it's just constantly saying there's a lot more out there that you probably have never heard of. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, in, in the specifics, you know, those are a couple on the reading list on my, on my, um, Facebook page, but it's constantly saying there's a, there's a much bigger library of things out there than, than maybe what you're used to. Like, and I love the way you said, we have a tendency just to listen to our own echo chamber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, what about you? What are some of the things that, I mean, you're, you're in a tough situation, not tough, but you're in a different situation than I am. How do you, how do you address well, that? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the pulpit and, and that's one of the things that I, that, that I, that I heard actually my my cousin, which is also a a, a pastor a preacher, uh, also a, a, a Afro Latino man, uh, he said that he makes the case of every sermon that he preaches include a uh, 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 other voice. So if he's preaching in a in a white church, he will include uh, a black preacher or the voice of a black preacher, the voice of a black poet. Uh, a black or Hispanic Latino voice so people mm -hmm. can get some exposure to it. Um, I've been suggesting readings. There are so many, so many uh, um, articles now online um, that I'm sometimes sharing on my on my page. I'm trying to not do too much on Facebook because I'm still dealing with some of the interactions and discussions that I'm having on social media. But, um, but yeah, I, the, the, the general kind of suggestion that I'm giving to people is, is get out of your echo chamber. Yeah. Try, really do the basic, Google black preacher, Google black author, or, or, well, I think most of the voices that we hear are from white preacher and white author. So I, I don't have that need to tell yeah. my black and Latino friends to do that. But to my white friends, I, I tell that Google black preacher, black author, black musician, Latino musician, Latino preacher, Latino author, and you're going to hear those different voices. And again, you're going to hear things that you agree on, things that you disagree, things that, that 
you have never heard or never thought about before. And just that will expand, I think, your knowledge and, and give you a different view, a different image of what uh, Black and Latino people are. So, um, well, and, and let me let me jump on that a little bit because I've seen this, and this may be a little direct, but I, I know you'll agree with me on this. It's really easy to proof text culture to find a person of color who already agrees with you and confirms your belief. We see, we all know the names, we all see the people that are that are doing that. Um, I, I think that's a very irresponsible way to read scripture to have a priest conceive belief or notion and then go through the concordance and find those four random scattered verses to go like look i'm right yeah, and we have yeah. a tendency to do that culturally too. see here's here's this one black person who just who agrees with me so they must speak for so i, I think in addition to finding voices of, of people of color we need to find voices of people of color who believe differently than we believe mm -hmm, because yeah. we tend to extrapolate well i found this one person that agrees with me so all black people must believe the same thing yes yeah and, and that gets into a, a, a different oh, conversation I know, I know that we need to end but just this black people is not don't black people <laughs> say it, say it, it's not, it. the black community is not a monolith we, yes. we are different, just yes. the same as white people, just the same as Latinos. Not right. all black people think the same, not all black people react the same. Not so, so, um, it's please know that. And, 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 and yeah, I, I just need to get that out of the system. <laughs> I wanted to lob one across the plate for you that you could knock out because I knew, yeah. <laughs> okay, we, we well, are about 55 minutes. Any final thoughts or? Yes, uh, people just need to be better disciples of Jesus Christ. People oh. need to love their neighbor as themselves. People need to do unto other what they wish uh, it was done unto them. People need to wish for the other what they wish for them and for their families. I think if we can start actually living that, actually doing what Jesus Christ told us to, um, we can move out of this a lot quicker, a lot easier. And um, um, I think this is the first step. Of course, there's a, a whole journey ahead, but I think right. this is always the first the first step. The same grace, generosity, kindness that you wish for you, the same way that you wish and want uh, all the institutions and organizations to deal with you. This is what uh, Black people in this country are fighting for and asking for now. Not to be better, not to be different, uh, to be treated differently, but just, the same well what and, about and, you and those of us who uh, haven't experienced what um people of color experienced have to be uh, brave enough and um on and honest enough to go i m my little slice of experience is not what everyone else experiences so in humility i, I need to sit and listen mm -hmm. and and the, the solidarity thing of, of what it's like to, and then grow my compassion and to do that. So, yeah, I think that's a that's good it. place for us to end this conversation. Absolutely. Nelson, thank you as very always, much, yeah. it's been a pleasure. Yes, definitely. And thank you very much for all those of you who have uh, participated in this conversation with us. If you want, uh, okay, Cal, how can people reach out to you? How can people get to know new community? I know that you are sharing this on your platform, but for people that are on my kind of end or my groups, how can people know more about you and new community? Um, obviously, this is on our Facebook page. We, we also are on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We have a website. We have an app. Um, and we'll constantly be producing more content. But if you have any questions or want to contact me or anyone on the staff, you can do it through this platform. And the, oh, YouTube. This will, this will be posted up on Facebook, on our Facebook and our YouTube. And those are great ways to contact us. What, about, what about you? Yeah, uh, about the same for um, uh, people. That we're, that's why we didn't talk about how we're going to share this. But um, yeah, so um, I'm for now, I'm the pastor of West Point First United Methodist Church. If you're watching this after June 30th, I'm at Griffin First uh, UMC, and you can reach us at, at GriffinFirstUMC.com or at WestPointFUMC.com, and uh, um, just 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 reach out if there's anything that we can do to help. Uh, please let me know. Yes, well, we look forward to hearing from you.
All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye.